Today on Two Crazy Ketos, we have a conversation with somebody that we really admire from the keto space, Dr. Ken Berry. And we'll find out what he has to say right, right after, after this. this. Hey, what's up, family? I'm Rachel. And I'm Joe. And we are Two, two Crazy, Crazy Ketos. If you're new to our channel, welcome. Here on Two Crazy Ketos, we do different things like recipe videos. We do product reviews. We talk about various keto topics. And then every Monday, we sit down on the couch for Keto on the Couch. We just kind of talk about what's going on in our lives for the week. You can find us in different social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And we have a website, which is twocrazyketos.com. That's where you're going to find all of our different recipes. Now, we do upload at least five new videos every single week. So make sure you subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to hit the little bell icon in that way every single time we upload a new video, you'll be alerted to it. So today we're going to kick off a brand new series here on Two Crazy Ketos. We don't really have a name for it, but basically it's going to be a video podcast where we're going to find some different people from within the keto space and ask them questions that may be on our minds or maybe even questions that you guys have for them as well. And I don't think that we could have started with a better guest than Dr. Ken Berry, somebody that we both have watched since the beginning of our own personal keto journey. He's such an awesome wealth of knowledge, but he is also very approachable, very fun, yeah. very funny. Of course, I'm pretty sure everybody knows who Dr. Berry is, right? Don't yeah. you think? I, I would hope so, in, but in case you've been living under a rock, Dr. Right. Berry is a family physician. Uh, he had a practice in Tennessee, and he has now since switched over to basically traveling to different keto conferences. He has a Facebook uh, a support group. He puts up videos almost daily, if not every other day on his YouTube channel, uh, answering questions, not only about keto, but just general health questions. So if you have questions about like, hey, can I do keto without a gallbladder? Or what about eating too much fat? He's probably answered that question in a video. Yes, he is such a wealth of knowledge on specific health concerns. And he has a great book out called Lies My Doctor Told Me. Yeah, if you haven't seen that book, I will leave a link to it down below because it is a great book to just hand to people when they start going like, hey, you're eating too much fat. Hand them that book. It's one of these books that you pick up and when you start reading, you're like, why didn't I think of that? That makes so much sense. And he's very funny and he's also very approachable. Yeah, and he also gets to the point. So I do wanna say, as you're getting ready to watch this, um, he doesn't hold back. Like he's going to tell you what's on his mind and sometimes it does upset people. It's nothing bad, but he's trying to get his point out of certain foods that we should not be eating and there's no excuses and he's gonna be very blunt about it. Now, when we did film this interview, the original plan was to kind of chop it up. But honestly, as we were talking to him, it became such a great interview. We're just going to run the entire thing. So it is a little long. It's going to be about 55 minutes. And what I'm going to do is down below in the description, I'm going to leave like a little note of where each question is. So if you want to jump to a specific question or maybe come back later on and catch up to where you like stopped off, you'll be able to do that. So I think best thing to do right now is just roll the footage and then we'll come back afterwards and just kind of wrap things up. Hey guys, how's it going? How good, are you how are doing? You? Wonderful. It's good to see you. What you up to? Just Staying quarantined, keeping busy. Yes. With college <laughs> hey. boys home from school. Oh, nice, nice, nice. How are you guys doing? I saw you guys had some more tornadoes. Yeah, Nashville is just having an unlucky year. So far, we've been very blessed that none of our possessions have been damaged, but our neighbors up the road really have had a rough time of it. So I wanted to start off, though, and just tell you thank you so much for everything that you've done and that you are continuing to do for the keto community. You know, I've been doing keto for three years now, and I started because of weight loss. You know, I was 285, almost 290 pounds. I needed to lose weight. I had all kinds of, you know, like I, I refused to go to the doctor, but I know, you know, for a fact that I was insulin resistant and, you know, I had high blood pressure and all of everything that went with it. And then in addition to having arthritis from a car accident 30 years ago, and I just wanted to lose the weight and get a little bit healthier, not knowing all of the other health benefits that come along with keto. And when I got started, it's right about when you were starting your YouTube channel. And 
you were the only medical professional really out there who was talking about keto. And I think you brought credibility to it to be able to make it be like, okay, I'm on the right track going when you're going against everything that society says of don't eat high fat. And you know, you should be consuming canola oil, not lard or butter or that kind of stuff. So I just wanted to say thank you for taking that stand. And basically being the voice that a lot of doctors don't want to talk about and, you know, going against popular opinion. So thank you. No, it's my pleasure. And obviously I enjoy doing this, but I also feel like that it's it's something that absolutely must be done. I feel called to do this and I won't ever stop. I, I think that I've been able to help more people improve their health through this this keto, low carb, carnivore journey than I was ever able to help improve people's health in the clinic. And so I'm very thankful and, and happy that I'm, I'm able to do this, but uh, it may, it, nothing makes me happier when somebody tells the story that you just told. And what a lot of people don't realize is back before I started all this, I was morbidly obese and pre-diabetic. And the, this literally stopped all that, all that went away. All that stopped happening to me when I stopped poisoning myself with the standard American garbage that we're all told is healthy. You've changed not only my life and Rachel's life, but through through you, through us, we've impacted her mom was a 20 year plus diabetic who's no longer on any of her diabetes medications. Well, and as a senior, I think it was the best possible uh, preparation for what we're going through right now. I mean, the 100%. fact that she's healthy and, you know, can't get to the doctor, you know, right now as easily as she probably, you know, previously could do. And I mean, it's just given us all a lot of peace. Of course, everybody's first question would have to be, how is your beautiful family doing through this quarantine? And what is it like having a little inchworm there in your home quarantined with baby B? We're all doing great. Um, I have to admit, I'm a little bored not being able to go places because I, <laughs> I love to travel. Even if that traveling is just up the road a piece, I love to travel. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're missing out on all the conferences, which I absolutely love meeting people and hearing their stories. Uh, Beckett is going to be six months old here in just a little bit. He's already got two little teefers in the bottom front, and he's uh, already chewing on uh, bones, and, and he's eating some scrambled egg, and he's eating some beef liver and he, chicken liver, and he loves it. And wow. he's right on the verge of crawling. He's, he's already doing the army crawl where he just uses his arms. And every now and then he'll get his knees up under him and get his butt tucked in like a good shortstop should. But he just can't, hadn't figured out the, the you know, the, the ambulation part of it yet. But, yeah, he's just he's, – he's ahead of his milestones on everything. That's and I think awesome. it's because he's exclusively breastfed. And the, the other things that he has been fed are animal, animal meat. That's what he's eating. He has not had any rice cereal. He has not had any – formula. He has not had any of the little crunchy little things that we're told are so healthy for a baby. And he probably never will until he goes to the first birthday party and he's out of our sight. Right. Yeah. We were actually talking about that on our live stream today about, you know, somebody suggested that like keto chow try to get into some nursing homes because of all of these things that they give to these, you know, the elderly patients, things like insurers and, or we're giving Pediasure to our children. And but all three of our children were fed formula. And we look back now, it's like, wow, if we would have known then what we know now, and when you look at the ingredients that are in these formulas now, and it's just, if it's at all possible to be breastfeeding or finding something other than giving these really disgusting products in these yeah. formulas. Yeah, they're really terrible. And let me be very clear. I, I, you know, you guys know I'm, I'm shy and I like to beat around the bush a lot. <laughs> right. <laughs> Pediasure is junk food. If you're going to give your child Pediasure, you might as well give them a jelly donut. Wow. Might, and with a can of Coke on the side. Pediasure is crap. It is not real human food for growing, developing human children. Stop giving your children Pediasure. Please stop that. That is, it is inflammatory junk food. It serves no useful nutritional purpose whatsoever in a human, a young growing human being. And then insure and all the crap that we give our, our older people is 
pure junk food. There's no meaningful nutrition in it. Any vitamins or minerals that have been added, because it sure didn't start with any, are usually inorganically made, factory made vitamins and minerals that aren't well absorbed at all. And one of the main problems with the older population is it becomes harder and harder for them to absorb nutrients through their gastrointestinal system. And so they need the, the, the vitamins and minerals that are married with real human food. So that's coming from meat and from liver and from a little veg, they can actually still absorb those minerals and vitamins. But if it's in, in Pedia, in, in, in Insure or any of that crap, I can't think of any of the other brand names right now because they, they piss me off so much that I've, I've blocked them out. But that you're, they're not absorbing any of that. All you're doing is spiking their blood sugar, spiking their insulin, increasing their levels of inflammation, and giving them no meaningful nutrition whatsoever. So what would you suggest to, say, a mom, a young mom who maybe is having a difficult time breastfeeding? What should she be giving her child instead of the insurers or the pediasurers or all those things? Yeah. So first of all, moms, do not hear judgment in my voice. There is no judgment. You just heard, heard these two fine people say that we formula fed all three of ours and we regret it, but we didn't know better. And but perhaps right. you don't know better. This is not a judgment. This is not condescending in any way. This is just us trying to say, hey, you could do way better than that. OK, yeah. uh, you could actually do good for your child. And so if a mom is just unable to breastfeed, I would a thousand times rather her get donor milk. And you can get this. They have they have donor breast milk banks that you can get milk from. But even if you get it from your neighbor there and I'm going to go into a little detail here because it's super easy to do. It's super ancestrally appropriate. We've been doing this for hundreds of thousands of years. They're, they used to be called wet nurses. We've, we've done it for the entirety of our existence on this planet. You need to have an HIV check. You need to have a hepatitis C check, a hepatitis panel, and you need to be checked for CMV. If you don't have those three things, you can donate your breast milk. And there are some women who could literally eat rocks and drink water and make 50 gallons of breast milk a day. <laughs> right. Nets, right. There are other women that could do everything exactly right and they'll make eight ounces a day, maybe. So for the woman who just cannot or you, you gave up and now you, you've dried up and it, it feels like it's too late. First of all, it may not be too late because a lot of times if you let a baby suckle at a breast, that breast will start to make milk again. Even if you think it's over, it may not be over. That's number one. Number two, put a Facebook message out there and say, I need some breast milk for my baby. Are people going to judge you? Yep. All right. And so you're going to tell the person when, when they volunteer, go get these three tests done real quick for me. That way, you know, there's no communicable disease going to be passed along. You've got good breast milk for your baby. I can just hear the, the people out there who are formula advocates crap in their pants right now, right? <laughs> breast milk, even from a stranger, is 1,000 times better for your infant than formula. Wow. Wow. That is good to know. Now, um, many times when we're stressed, our weight loss plans, really they, we know now that there are our health improvement plans go out the window and we almost categorize them as non-essential as if we need to focus on more important issues in this time. So is yeah. it good to put our health improvement plans on the back burner right now? Well, of course not. And you knew it. I, you knew I was going to say that. But I want you to think about the bigger picture here. Why is that? Why do we think, oh, I don't have time to think about my health right now? That's because that's exactly how big food and big pharma want you to think. I don't, I don't have to worry about my health today. I'll worry about that tomorrow, right? I'm going to eat the Cheetos today, and I'm going to take the metformin today, and I'll worry about my health another day. They make billions of dollars when you think that way and we've been we've been based all of us our age have been raised from the cradle to think that way and so it's perfectly natural for us to put our health on the back burner to put our nutrition like yeah that's number 12 on my to-do list i'll get right. to that but i've got first of all i gotta pay my cable and i've got to upgrade my, my my cell phone package and i've got to paint the living room and then i've got to you know whatever i don't know but none of that is more important than your health. And right. the, I think the ancient scholars had it exactly right. Health is the ultimate wealth. And if you don't have health, nothing else really matters. And you can ask people who were very, very sick in the past. If I'd have given you a million dollars back then, they'd be like, I wouldn't give a damn. I, I, I could care less. It didn't, wouldn't have helped me a bit. I just wanted my health back. That's what this way of eating is going to give you. And it's time you give it a try. 
So I have another question for you. And in the same thing, we talk, you advocate for not counting calories. I see so many people, and there's so much misinformation. You see so many people who a lot of, you know, we all respect, talk about like you need to watch your calories. That's something that I've always worried about. The two of us really screwed up our metabolism over the years, where at one point, Rachel was eating less than 500 calories a day and still gaining weight because she was yep. only eating oatmeal. Yeah. So when you say to not count calories, does that a license of you could eat whatever you want as much as you want all day long? Like, because I see a lot of people who think, well, Dr. Barry said, don't count calories. That means I can eat all day long. And so long as I'm eating carnivore and so long as I'm not eating a bunch of processed food, I'm not going to gain any weight. Can you like expand upon that a little yeah. bit? Because I know you talk I, about it in your book. Yep. And I was almost ready to give you a yes until you added in the all day long thing. If you would take that one phrase out, then I would say, yes, I 100% agree with every, everything you just said. And so if anybody believes that calorie restriction is a, a method of weight loss, let's talk about your partner there. She was eating 500 calories a day and gaining weight. How is that even physically possible if the first law of thermodynamics applies to human fat loss? And that's the part that tricks everybody. We don't want to lose bone. and We don't want to lose muscle mass. We don't want to lose... Uh, fascia or ligament or tendon. We don't want to lose any of that. We want to lose fat. And if, if what you want to lose is fat, then the first law of thermodynamics has no place in this discussion. Because first of all, the human body is not a closed system. We are an open system that's open to the out, outside world. So there are leaks everywhere. The first law of thermodynamics applies only to a closed system where you can control every single thing in that system. Human bodies ain't that. Secondly, our ancestors, for the last quarter of a million years that we've been homo sapiens sapien, never counted calories. If there was food, they ate till they were stuffed, and then they stopped eating. And then they didn't eat again until they were full, hungry again, then they ate again, right? And so the, the entire myth of snacking, is something that has been invented by the big food corporations. They want you to snack all day. Right. And then uh, ignorantly, the medical profession and the nutrition profession, I don't even know what the hell they were thinking, but then they picked up on it and act like, yes, you should have three meals a day with snacks in between. That's very right. healthy. Yeah. <laughs> right. And I don't think that they sold out. I don't think that there's a conspiracy here. I just think that they're lazy and ignorant. And they were like, well, I don't know. It sounds good. I'll just go with that. But never in the history of humanity before there were big food corporations did people snack all day. You ate discreet meals, and then that was it. And so if you re-ask me that question and say, Dr. Barry, do you think that if a person eats as much as they want without regard to portion or calorie in one or two meals a day and then didn't do any snacking in between, could that person gain weight? And my answer would be if they were eating on the spectrum of the proper human diet, my answer would be no. I defy you. I defy you. I, I'll put up a thousand dollar challenge. You can eat as much as you want in one or two meals a day of the of the proper human diet foods, not of the processed crap, right? Mm -hmm. And the insulin spiking crap. I defy you to gain fat. Now you might gain some bone density, yeah. and that'll show up on the scale. You might gain some muscle, and that'll mm -hmm. show up on the scale. But you're not going to gain fat eating one or two meals as much as you can eat until you're stuffed. I mean, push back from the table like I cannot eat another bite. Counting calories is stupid. We've been told to count <laughs> calories since the 1960s, and it's went hand in hand with the obesity epidemic. Mm -hmm. Counting That's calories true. never works. It has not worked. It never will work. Stop counting calories. Counting calories is stupid. I'm sorry to be around the bush. Portion control, if you're eating the proper human food, portion right. control is unnecessary. Your body has t at least two hormones that help you with hunger. Their names are leptin and ghrelin, right? Mm -hmm. And when you've eaten enough real nutrient-dense food, your leptin and ghrelin will move to the sweet spot and you're, you will be satiated. You will be full. You will be stuffed and you'll be like, oh, you'll be done. Like, I can't eat anymore. I'm done. Okay. So you've got to understand all of this stuff together. Right. And when you, when you get it all together in your head, you're like, 
that does make a lot of sense. We've only been told to count calories and right. move more and eat less. Actually, it's Coca-Cola who came up with the move more, eat less. Wonder why they came up with that. <laughs> was it was it to fight obesity or was it to sell more Coca-Cola? Right. For Coke. They want you to believe that a calorie is a calorie, whether it comes from Coca-Cola or it comes from beef liver. They want you to believe that because if you believe that, they get to make hundreds of millions of dollars. Right. Yeah. And it's interesting because when we were out in Omaha with you and Dr. Cywis yeah. and Nurse Cindy, you know, we were talking to Nurse Cindy and she was talking about checking her blood sugar to see like, am I physically hungry or am I mentally hungry? Right. And I'm fortunate enough, you know, that we live very close, about 30 minutes south of Dr. Cywis's office. So I had an appointment yeah. with him and, and I was able to get a CGM and it has been really interesting where I want to have something to eat and I will go check my glucose just on the CGM and be like, uh, your glucose level is like 90 something. You don't need right. to eat. Right. And it's been really, it's all along with that. It's been surprising to see not yep. having, being somebody who hasn't had sugar in three years, how just doing something like getting up in the morning to go to the restroom at three o'clock will elevate my glucose level according to the CGM. So it's really interesting to see how your body will create the glucose that it needs. You don't have to give it. Exactly so that's right. been really amazing to watch with that CGM. Oh, and let me say everybody listening, if you if you have prediabetes, type 2 diabetes or type 1 diabetes, I want you to call your doctor's office today. Maybe not go see your doctor, but call them and say, I need you to fax me an order for a continuous glucose monitor to the pharmacy right now. Mm -hmm. And and if they say, well, blah, 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 say, no, I need you to do it right now. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you to order me a CGM right now. I have prediabetes. I have type 2 diabetes. Why have you not already ordered me a CGM, doctor? Mm. Okay, <laughs> that's how important these things are. If you've ever had one high blood sugar in your entire life, you need a CGM. Okay, and, it, and it, I think the reason that we need things like that is because we've been brainwashed our entire life. Our ancestors, I was talking about earlier, 100,000 years ago, they didn't need that. They did, They were never confused by boredom feels like hunger, or right. thirst feels like hunger, or or I'm pissed off at my wife that I must be hungry. They knew what hunger felt like, and many people in the keto and carnivore community were able to rediscover what true hunger feels like, and it, it's not what most people think hunger is, right? And the right. CGM helps you to kind of tease out, am I truly hungry, or am I just bored, or am I just upset about this, that, or the other, and my cortisol spike, now I feel like I'm hungry, but I'm really not. Let me ask you a question. How many times in the last 60 seconds has your heart beat? No idea. No idea. You don't know. You you haven't been tracking that. No. You don't. You don't record that with a with an app. And no. yet we're still living. But yet it's still beating. That's how, right. How, how many how many ounces of water have you drank today? Don't know. Couldn't tell you. Oh, I used to but, know exactly, but now right. I drink and when I'm thirsty. Damn thing, I right? keep one of these things mm. around me, and when I'm thirsty, I drink, and when I'm not, I don't drink. That's funny. What about your your sodium level in your blood right now? What is it? Are you not tracking that? You don't no. know? No. So I'm being, a, I'm being an ass here, but I'm trying to make a point. <laughs> when you eat the proper human diet, you don't need to track how many times a minute you're breathing. Your body's got that. You don't That's need good. to track your how many times a minute your heart beats. Your body's got that. You don't have to worry about that. When you're eating the proper human diet and you've reversed all of your metabolic disease, your body will tell you when you're hungry and your body will tell you when you're full. Now, a lot of us like me and you guys and, and Nurse Cindy, we were bamboozled our entire life, both as children and adults. And so it may be that our metabolism is always going to be a little confused. But, and so we may need a CGM or we may need to track this or that or the other for a while, if not forever. I don't know. None of us know because we've never been here before. Right? right. But what I do know is there was a time on the planet when there was was no such thing as an ob obese human. It just didn't exist. Right. Just like there's no obese wild deer or wild coyote. They're never obese because when they're hungry, they eat. When they're not hungry, they don't eat. Right. And we we are hardwired for that just like they are. But we've been so tricked by big food and big pharma to think that all these other feelings are hunger, that it's really hard for us to tease out what's true hunger and what's not true hunger. 
it's amazing because we just finished a 72 hour fast that we started last Wednesday. We ended <clears throat> yesterday morning. We actually went like 80 hours. And it always amazes us when we do the 72 hours with red mints or something else that the first 24 hours, all your hormones kick in when you're supposed to eat and be like, you need to eat. But if you can get yep. 10, 15 minutes past that, you're not hungry. Yep. And by hour 24, you're like, how am I less hungry now than I was 12 started. hours ago? And then at 40, yep. the last time we did the 72 hour fast, we just were not hungry. We wanted to see how far we can go. We went go like 110 hours. And it yep. always amazes us that why am I not hungry three days in, but I'm hungry eight hours after I've eaten my yep. regular meal. Yeah, even your hunger hormones get into a habit. And so that's why most people that first 24 hours, they're like, man, I feel like I should eat. But right. are you truly hungry? Well, not really. Then don't eat. And so, but then after about 24 to 36 hours, your body's like, oh, okay, well, it's fine. No worries. And you stop having that, that false sense of hunger. But I guarantee you guys, if you were out in the wilderness for a week or two of fasting, when you got truly hungry, you would eat a dead possum if you found it. Right. And you right. would have water if you were truly thirsty, because that's what we do. We're mammals. And so I, I think it's I think the, the, the two and three and five day fasts are an excellent learning tool for many of us. And I don't think it's mandatory or necessary no. for everybody. But if you're interested, it's it you learn so much about yourself, both mentally and how your body actually works when you do a 48 or a 72 hour longer fast. You get you get you get in touch with the physical part of your body. It's like you reform the mental and the physical links that should have always been there, but perhaps weren't because we've just been so misinformed. A lot of people, when we started our fast the other day, and I know Chris and Miriam also <clears throat> fasted, were making comments that they have seen online that you should not be fasting in the midst of everything going on right now because it affects your immunity. What is your thought of that? Yeah, fasting definitely does affect your immunity in a good way. Okay. It doesn't do anything negative to your immunity. Now, I also don't believe that eating a, a lot of fatty ribeye affects your immunity in any negative way either. Uh, Thank goodness. But eating, yeah, eating any kind of carbohydrates absolutely mucks up the part of your immune system called the innate immune system. And I've actually right. got a YouTube video about this, mm -hmm. which diet boosts your immunity. 100%, not joking, not kidding around. If you're if you're eating a high carbohydrate diet filled with whole grains and all that crap, your immune system is weakened by that. And I actually put the research in the show notes of that yeah. video. So if anybody's like, no, that's ridiculous. We will definitely link that down below. Even a transient elevation in blood sugar. And that means you're completely normal. You don't have diabetes, but you just ate a jelly donut and you spiked your blood sugar. Even that temporal, just random spike in blood sugar weakens your immune system for a day or two. Yeah. People don't realize that when you eat carbs, you weaken your immune system for hours after that. Okay. You spike your blood sugar, you spike your insulin, and you fiddle with your leptin. And a lot of people don't realize leptin's very intimately involved with your with optimal immune function. Right. And so when you eat any of those insulin spiking foods you just screwed up your immune system for anywhere from eight to 24 hours. Right. That's the bad news. The good news is, given the times we're living in, is that if somebody's listening to this and they have no idea what low-carb keto carnivore is, you can absolutely start to improve your immune system's function in 24 hours. Wow. De depending on how bad your immune system is currently mucked up by your garbage diet, Within 24 hours, you could increase your immune strength by 20%, 30%, maybe even 50% just by getting the carbohydrates out of your mouth. That's going to help your blood sugar return to normal and more importantly, help your insulin level return back to low normal and move your leptin level back to normal. All three of those things, and you can look at the research on the video, that's what strengthens your immune system. Okay, it's not taking some herb or some root or some berry. All that stuff's bullshit. Pardon me. Okay, what you need to do is stop eating too many carbohydrates. Stop eating industrial seed oil. Stop eating inflammatory grains. Those are the things that are weakening your immune system. Since we're talking about carbohydrates, I'm going to try to get you in a little bit more trouble now. So net carbs, total carbs. 
Yeah. The hot topic, 50% yeah. of the community says net carbs, 50% says total. We yeah. have, and most people start off on net carbs. We always tell people, listen, if you're going to do net carbs, at least put a total carb cap on yourself so that you don't overdo your, I mean, but the problem that we have with a complete net carb protocol is people are doing it because number one, let's face it, they don't want to cut stuff out. But my problem is, is that so many of the companies that are now, especially the big food companies like Slim Fast and stuff, are coming out with these products. And what they're doing is they're playing the fiber game. They're taking yep. things like IMO fiber. They're using that as the sweetener, things that will affect your blood sugar, that will spike your insulin. And people are looking fiber. I can deduct it. And then they're getting into trouble. Yep, so you're what right. is your where is your stance on net carbs and total carbs? Well, let me just ask you this. You guys have been in this space for a minute. Uh, everybody starts out counting net carbs. Mm -hmm. What do you, what's, but what's the trend? The longer you're keto, what do you finally wind up doing? Switching over. You have to. The total carbs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's, and so here's, the, here's, and I'm not, I'm not an authoritarian. Okay. Here's my stance on this. If you're just starting keto, count net carbs. It's fine. If, as long as you are losing fat and your inflammation's getting better and you're doing better and your waistline's getting better, keep counting net carbs. I have I don't have a dog in this fight, but but when your fat loss stalls mm -hmm. and you're like I don't understand I'm doing everything right, that's when you go back and you watch my video about the 13 reasons why you stall and then you go oh net carbs, uh, fiber, ah, uh, because the truth of the matter is, and all the gurus out there will tell you that we don't get any calories from, from fiber at all. Mm -hmm. And that's absolutely untrue. The average fiber is going to account for about two grams of carbohydrates per, okay? Mm -hmm. Not four grams like a normal carbohydrate, but it's going to count for anywhere from 1.5 to 2.5 grams of carbs per. And so they don't tell you that part, right? And especially right. like oat fiber, you get a ton of carbs. You don't get four grams per, but you do get carbohydrate. You get carbs. You're able to break down some of the fiber in oat fiber and many of the other, other fibers, you can partially break them down. And I'm not talking about your, your colon bacteria breaking them down into short chain fatty acids. I'm talking about your jejunum in your small intestine can break some of these fibers down into carbohydrates if anybody doesn't believe me, put your CGM on that you've made your doctor get you and then eat a, a bunch of those fiber bars and watch your blood sugar. And then we, you'll never argue about it again. We've talked about me doing an experiment like at one point, but I know what the result is going to be. So I don't want to do it to my body uh, because right. people are always like, hey, like net carbs, yeah. net carbs, you can eat as much yeah. as you want. And I've always said like. I can turn 200 net carbs into less than tw 200 total carbs into less than 10 net carbs. No yep. problem. There are plenty of par products like these zero carb breads yep. that they're saying are zero carb, but they're like, you know, ridiculous total carbs. Yep. And I've said to Rachel, like, I should do an experiment to prove what I'm saying by saying, like, I'm going to eat, say, like, 200 total carbs, but less than 10 net carbs and watch what this does to my blood sugar right. and the weight and everything else. But I know yeah. what's going to do to my body and I don't want to screw my body up. I don't want you to do that either. But there's two ways that that gurus and influencers and food companies are able to enter the keto space. One is to count net carbs. That's a trick. It's a trick, folks. OK, mm -hmm. you can make a, a bar and it can have two net net grams of, of carbs. You can make a shake two net carbs, right? But in reality, that's going to spike your blood sugar and spike your insulin. How's that How's that helping? Number two, the second big lie that they'll use is if it fits your macros, right? right? Yeah. And a lot of these low-carb breads, the first damn ingredient is wheat. And I'm like, who thought that was keto? What are you right. doing? Yeah. <laughs> Shut up. Oh, oh, no, it's a tortilla wrap. It's only got two net, and it, and, and it fits my macros. So if it fits your macros, you're you're deluding yourself and you're letting big food again trick you just like they've done all your life. Mm -hmm. If you go with net carbs, you are deluding yourself. And again, you're letting big food trick you and make a dupe out of you just like they've done for your entire life. Count total carbs and ingredients 100 percent matter, even if it does fit your macros. It's funny because we always say that 
we're both addicts. Don't tell an addict they can have unlimited. Right. right. Because right. we're right. absolutely it's insane. Like giving, it's, it's like giving an alcoholic that non-alcoholic beer. And yeah. that's not asking for trouble. Well, then what are you doing? You're, right. you're drinking fake beer. You're an alcoholic. Should you be doing that? Or an alcoholic who used to love his vodka, you're giving him a beer because that's got way less alcohol. And it, it right. fits his alcohol macros. And so it's okay. <laughs> yeah. So good. Well, well, since we're talking about the food industry, grocery shopping looks very different right now. And more than ever, parents need to be very strategic when shopping for their kids. What yep. are some grocery items that you think that they should be reaching for? And is this a good time to start working sugar out of their kids' lives while they aren't having play dates, attending parties, and sitting beside children who may yep. be having sugar-rich lunches that are very enviable? Yeah, absolutely agree. This is the perfect time, not only because you want to increase your child's immune system, right? You want them to have the strong immune system, but also because of all the hundreds of other low-carb keto uh, carnivore benefits, right? So, yes, this is a perfect time to get sugar out of their mouth. And so let's, get, let's go even one step better. Let's say it's a parent who's on a budget. Let's even make it even harder, okay? Yeah. So when you go to the store, you need stuff that's shelf stable and you also need stuff that your kids are actually going to eat. So let's get some eggs. Let's get some potted meat. Let's get some spam. Let's get some deviled ham. Let's get some uh, meat skins or pork rinds, right? I guarantee you the, the lays are sold out, but the meat skins are not. Guaranteed. Right. 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 Get some ground hamburger. You can put it in your freezer. You can buy 10 pounds and put it in your freezer. Buy some bacon, and people think bacon's expensive, but remember, you're getting two things out of bacon. You're getting the tasty bacon, but you're also getting the bacon grease for the next right. meal, too, right? And so, actually, bacon is a twofer, so you're getting two products. Uh, your kids may not like sardines, but if, you're, if your husband or your granddad does, man, we've got so many cans of sardines in our house right now because when all this started hitting, I was like, you know, we better stock up just in case. It ain't going to hurt nothing. And so we did, and I've, I've got all kinds of canned seafood in the in the cabinet, which will last for two or three years. So I'm not going to waste a penny. I've right. probably got 20 pounds of ground beef in the freezer, right? If 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 nothing happens, I'll just eat the ground beef. Exactly. I, won't, I won't lose a penny, right? But if something bad does happen, man, I've got a ton of fat and protein in the in the pantry and in the freezer. We're going to be okay for a minute. And I think uh, every kid likes eggs in some way, mm -hmm. right? And so if, if – and let me talk to parents. If, if the only low-carb keto carnivore food you can get your kid to eat is scrambled eggs, that's it. They won't eat anything else. If your kid eats nothing but scrambled eggs for a week, are they going to develop any nutritional deficiencies? Mm -hmm. I'm, yeah. going to, I'm going to let you think about that for a minute. None. Right. And so if your kid will eat nothing but bacon and eggs or scrambled eggs and they'll eat a few meat skins, are they going to develop any nutritional deficiencies? No. no. So if all they'll eat is eggs, they eat them eggs. And when they're done eating eggs, they can go outside and play, but not around other people. Just in the back. Right. <laughs> right. Right. But you see my point when you're right. eating a nutrient dense food like meat. They're not going to develop any nutritional deficiencies. They're going, to, they're going to be getting everything they need. Go out in the backyard and play, get some vitamin D in the sunlight, eat a few berries maybe if you can get your hands on them. That's it. That, you're done. That's all you need. You don't need anything else. Eating the rainbow is a myth. Your kids don't have to do that, okay? Uh, eating lots of whole grains and eating lots of different vegetables, that's all below, nothing. That's, that's wor it's worthless mythology is what it is. doesn't help your kids be healthier at all. It actually probably promotes obesity. They need to eat lots of meat, and if they want some veg, it's great. If they don't want some veg, they can go outside and play. So to go along with that, you know, you've you've switched to mostly carnivore, which we're pretty much keto carnivore too. Probably like keto 90, 95 percent. Very few vegetables, yep. occasional avocado or something like that. But more and more people that are switching to carnivore, especially when you get into the forums and on the Facebook groups, and and you get the keto police, and they're saying if you're not eating grass-fed meat, if you're not eating pasture-raised eggs, if you're not eating grass-fed butter, then you're not really carnivore. You're not really keto. You're really just low carb. What is your opinion on that? So either the people saying that are really stupid 
or they own uh, like uh, one of the big YouTube influencers. He has his own farm and he sells grass fed, grass finished meat. And so guess what he thinks you should eat, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, but now I think I think that I've said a time or two in my life that you can do keto with hot dogs and mustard. Yes. And I 100% believe that. I 100% practice that some days when I'm not in the mood for anything else. I'll just I'll eat a whole pack of hot dogs, however many's in there, eight or ten, with mustard, and that literally is one of my meals in the day. That's it. And I feel great. I do great. Everything. All my numbers are great. It's fine. The there, yes. Grass fed, grass finished panda massage meat is three to five percent better for you, but it costs twenty two dollars a pound. Right. And so if you can't afford that, I would much rather you do keto with spam and potted meat and hot dogs and bologna and mustard than I would you go and eat the standard American garbage crap. We change things over time. You know, we started <clears throat> right. off like you're talking about hot dogs and mustard. And then I remember I went to Rachel, I'm like, okay, it is time. We're gonna start improving the quality of food because we noticed we were not spending the money on the garbage. And all of a sudden we had more money in the bank that we yep. weren't spending on our groceries. So we said, we're yep. gonna take that money and spend it on better quality food. Yep. And the first and, thing we yep. did was the eggs. We yep. switched over to pasture raised eggs and now I can't eat anything else because of the difference. Right. But I Absolutely. remember the look on her face when I said, we're gonna pay $6 a dozen for eggs. What is the first thing if you had to tell if someone was going to switch in order, what is the first thing that they're normally eating that you would tell them get out of your diet right now? You mean somebody eating the standard American diet? Yeah, I'm not talking about sugar. I'm talking about like something that would be considered keto, like fats or something uh, like that. I would say get you got to lower your carbohydrate count even more and eat more meat because I, I don't think everybody should be a carnivore. But I think that everybody's plate should be at least two thirds meat, okay, if not three quarters. And if you want a little side of veg or you want a little side of berries, I think that's probably fine. Occasionally, I would not overdo that. Uh, and I, I'm with you. Every now and then, I'll eat some pickles or I'll eat some olives or I'll eat some avocado, right? Or even some blueberries. Very rarely, not 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 often at all. But those are fruits. Those are not vegetables, right? And so, yeah, I think a lot of the vegetables are completely and totally unnecessary. If you like them, then say that and eat them. But don't pretend that they're some kind of superfood or they're some kind of they're new, very nutrient dense. Because, I mean, if you took a, a 100 grams of beef liver and put it up against 100 grams of kale and just listed the nutrition, uh, kale is a distant second place. Kale is in no way a superfood. Meat is a superfood. If you like a little veg, then that's fine. But but you don't need to eat veg to get every vitamin and mineral and every fatty acid and every amino acid that are essential for optimal human function. Now, kind of in that same um, vein, how do you think all of this that we're going through right now will impact greenwashing in America when it comes to our food sources? For instance, do you think that we'll see more of a of a push toward laboratory created Franken foods like Beyond Meat, or do you believe that there will be more of a return to the American farmland? Yes, all that. You're gonna, <laughs> you're gonna have every bit of that. Every single, uh, what do we wanna call them? Uh, click from big food to the vegans to everybody. Everybody's gonna try to capitalize on this catastrophe. That's that uh, I don't I don't even want to say that's human nature, but that's definitely corporate nature yeah. is to never let a good catastrophe go to waste. They, they're always going to try to capitalize on that somehow and come out smelling like a rose and looking like a good guy, even though they just capitalize on people's misery. Yes, they do that. They've done that. They'll continue to do that. What what I think and Nisha, about we've talked about this a lot. I think we're going to see in, in people who actually think for themselves. Mm -hmm. We're going to see a return to people actually having a garden in the backyard, mm -hmm. to having some chickens in the backyard, to maybe even having a sheep or two or a cow or two or a pig or two in the, in the backyard, to people buying locally. And I think, there's, I, I, I hope and I sort of predict there's going to be a huge return to the buy local, shop local, grow local, sell local. I think after all the shortages that we've seen because of our just-in-time delivery mm -hmm. and our, our our methods of we make this part in India and this part in China and this part in Canada, then we move it all to Chicago and put it together. 
that makes me very uncomfortable. I'm not okay with that at all. I would much rather have a local craftsman and a local farmer and a local butcher. I want to, I'm going to try to do everything local. And I hope everybody else out there is like, yeah, that sounds like as far as resiliency goes, that's probably a real good idea. And I hope that we see that, but I don't know if we will. You never know. People are These fickle. are things that we're even trying to do right now. We're looking into right now, trying to find chickens, which you can't even find them right now. Trying to find baby one-day-old chickens right now. They're Gosh. sold out around the country, yep. but we're trying to yep. get some backyard chickens. We eat almost a dozen eggs a day, so we can't have enough chickens to give us. But if we can supplement, yep. that would be great. <clears throat> We're looking into buying a half a cow or a whole cow share so it's from a local farmer instead yep. of buying from stuff yep. that's coming from Australia and things like that. Yep, We've been so, doing that for a few years. We, we get a full pig and half a cow. And people don't realize this, but you can actually tell the farmer, hey, I don't want I don't want any steroids, any antibiotics unless they're sick. I also don't want them to eat any grain. If you want grass finished, he'll do that for you. But he's going to tell you, well, now you're not going to have the marbling. And it's not going to taste as good and they won't weigh as much. But if that's what you want, I'll do that. It, there's no law that farmers have to, to grain finish their cows, right? Or their So pigs. would you suggest with that grain finish? So like if we're looking to buy a local cow, do you think <clears> it's absolutely necessary that we find a grass finished cow? If we're trying to buy a cow or is it okay if you get a grain finished or a grain fed so long as they're not feeding them a GMO grain? Right. Yeah. And so what you what I think is ideal is you want the cow to be on pasture for 70 or 80 percent of their life. And indeed, uh, uh, Dr. Peter Bowerstead, you may have heard of that yes. guy. Oh, yeah. He tells me and he's kind of an expert in the area. Yeah. He says that even the cheapest beef you can buy at China Mart has been on pasture for at least 70 to 80 percent of its life. Wow. Only in the last few weeks does it come into the feedlot and it's fed a blend of grains, but a, a huge percentage of the silage that they feed them is ground up broccoli shoots and, and the wheat, the, the, the leaves and the stems of all this different stuff. And there is grain in there, no doubt, but it's not 100% grain that they're being fed. And so I love grain finished beef. I, it tastes better to me. It's, it's more fatty. I like it. And I'll probably even when I've got $800 million in the bank from all this money I'm making on keto. <laughs> I will still eat grain finished beef and, and I'll probably have a farmer who will keep that cow on the pasture for 90% of its life. And then for two or three weeks before that it goes to slaughter, it'll come in and it'll eat grain and get nice and fat and marble so that I can enjoy it for later. Well, uh, Dr. Barry, one of the things that's so great about you is you do generate laughter. Yes. I mean, you're just, you're so fun with everything that you present. And they do say that laughter is the best medicine, but how important is your <clears throat> attitude really when it comes to maintaining good health? And what are some ways that you personally like to relax and sort of de-stress in this very anxious atmosphere? Attitude is, is, is very, very important. The only problem is, is you can't make somebody with a bad attitude believe that. So right. yeah. it's kind of, that's why I don't talk about that stuff much because if you got a good attitude, you know what I'm talking about. If you got a bad attitude, you don't want to hear it anyway. So there right. you go. We, everybody just wasted their time. But what we're doing to spend the time and to not go nuts is I'm trying to put out more content. I'm trying, I'm trying to get in the gym and lift weights, but I have to be honest. I suck at that. Me too. Me too. I <laughs> suck. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll get my, my earbuds in and I'll be listening to a book on tape. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to work out for an hour. And I might be in there 10 minutes and I'm like, God, this is boring. I want to go <laughs> do something else. Okay. And so then I go do something else. But so what I've taken to doing is I'll go in there and I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to be in the gym for 10 minutes. Damn it. Now what, what in the world? And so I'll go and I'll just do, I'll do deadlifts to failure. I'll do one set to failure. And I think I got 235 pounds, whatever four plates is on my, and I'll just do that until I can't do any more. That's it. That's my workout. I'm done. And wow. then another day I'll go in there and I'll do squats like that with, with, I don't know, about 300, just, uh, as many sets of reps as I can go. One set, no warm up. That's it. I'm done. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I'll go and I'll, I'll do something else like that. Or I'll get on my rowing machine and just go flat out for three minutes until I'm about ready to puke. And then that's it. I'm done. <laughs> and so far, that's working pretty good. And yeah. so I think, I think I'm, I'm going to come up with a new book. It's going to be called Dr. Barry's three minute workout. <laughs> I was just going to ask you, I when's the it. next book going to come out? Well, I'm, I'm working on it right now. I'll tell you, writing a book is hard and yeah. it's a labor of love. And if you're not 
pissed off about something, it's it's hard to. I, I don't know how people just write books as a method of 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 income. I can't do it. And so I've got two more books that I'm really passionate about, and I'm working on them right now. But unless I'm passionate about it, I just can't. I can't. I can't sit down and sit still and write about it. If I feel like people's lives are being injured or people are suffering, I can I can sit down and focus and I can I can work on that. And so I'm, I'm working on one right now called the Proper Human Diet. And that's I think is going to be basically the culmination of everything we've talked about today. Not just the foods you put in your mouth, but also not eating, also sleeping, also activity, all the stuff put up, put together with a bow put on top of it. And then uh, Kim Howerton, the ketonist and I are oh, working I, on, yes. on a lab book that, that helps people understand which labs you should ask your doctor mm -hmm. for, what the labs mean, what the values mean, what's optimal versus normal and all that kind of stuff. And, and so probably the lab book will be the next one out. It's going to be very small but I think very, very useful for people who uh, have doctors in their life. And then the proper human diet, who the hell knows, whenever whenever I get done. Well, we appreciate it because, you know, we've talked to, to you before, like some of the conferences. I mean, our channel is all about, we try to be support because we did this by ourselves and we want to be the support for the people that don't have support. But without you and putting out the knowledge and having the MD behind your name to say like, hey, listen, this isn't like Joe and Rachel who read a book or did everything trial and error. Here is a medical professional who can give you the science and what it actually does to your body. It means nothing. So it's, it's so important that you continue doing what you're doing. And we appreciate it. It. We really do. Don't worry. And, I'll never stop, no matter what burns down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So one more question. Do you want to ask it? Yes. So moving forward, what are some health habits that we should be maintaining even after our nation gets the all clear? Yeah. So you've got to eat the proper human diet. That's what it all comes down to. That is the foundation that all health is built on. If you're not going to eat the proper human diet, then it doesn't matter what pill you take or what injection you take or what pill, powder, potion, herb, root. It doesn't matter. All that stuff is superfluous if you're ignoring the foundation of your health, which is your diet, both what you eat and what you don't eat. Well, I think so, that's about it. Dr. Berry, thank you so thank much. Thank you so much for your Hopefully time. we'll get to see you at a conference soon. We were looking Absolutely. forward to all the conferences. We were going to drive to KetoCom. We were flying out to Salt Lake. And I know, I know, I know, I know. We're well, going nuts we'll, not seeing people. Exactly. We'll see you guys as soon as we possibly can. And thanks so much for having me on. This is awesome. You guys are killing it on, on YouTube. I love your videos. Well, thank we appreciate you so it. Much. Thank you. Have Rachel's a over afternoon. here being all common sense. And Joe's <laughs> over here like, what? <laughs> We try to have fun with it. You know, we have to bring some laughter. Like you say, you have to bring some laughter, some humor. We try to be, we try to support people. There's so many people that are out there like, I just can't do this. I don't know what to do. And, you know, so, you know, we can tell you what we did because the one thing for us is that there's other people who we respect in the community, but we were what a lot of people are. We were obese. You know, yeah. I weighed 290 pounds. Rachel weighed 250 pounds. So we've gone through it and we know what it's like to, you know, get the, you know, the cravings for eating yeah. junk and stuff like that. And so many yeah. people come to us all the time and they're like, oh, well, it's okay to have a cheat day. I'm like, I don't, I personally don't think so. I mean, yeah. your bottom yeah, I mean, line is yeah, that's your addict alcoholic. talking. The alcoholic gets to have a beer every Friday, right? That's his cheat right. day. No, exactly. No. Well, <laughs> what I want to say to you guys is, I don't want. I want you to stop underestimating the effect that you're having. Okay, you oh, absolutely thank you. do not have to be a doctor to to literally change people's life and and save their life and affect their health. And you guys are doing that every day, and you're such a great example for everybody else out there. You don't have to have initials behind your name to be right. Aww. Thank you. Somebody well, your heart. Hand. That was a good one. Okay. <laughs> you don't have to. You can literally show your neighbor. Your neighbor hasn't seen you in six months and you go out to the mailbox. They're like, what the hell happened to you? Right. You're right. like, keto, ask me out. Yeah. yeah. That's it. That's so good. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Take care of that lovely family and Nisha and that baby Beckett. And, and we're enjoying her singing. Yes. Her it's singing yesterday awesome, was awesome. Right? Love it. So, yes. yeah. Thank we you will, so much, guys. Hopefully we'll see you soon. See Bye. you next time.
Wow, wasn't that a great interview? That was so awesome. It was just so nice to be able to sit down and get some of my questions answered that I've had. And I know a lot of you guys also have the same questions. And he's just such an approachable person. If you happen to be out at a conference after all of this season is over, don't be afraid to go and approach him and share your transformation story with him. He really does love to hear, you know, the influence that he's had for the positive in people's lives. Yeah, just the way you saw him talking to us, that's how he is in real life. So yeah, like Rachel said, don't be afraid to walk up and just talk to him, ask him questions, things like that. Now I do wanna say, if you are not following him on YouTube, make sure you go subscribe to his channel. I will leave a link for that down below. Also go uh, follow him on Facebook, on his Instagram, his Twitter. Um, he's always following it. He does has a Patreon to help support him if you wanna be able to support what he's doing that way. Uh, it's greatly appreciated by him. And the thing is, is, you know, we need more people like Dr. Yes. Barry in this community to help educate so that, because their goal is to not only educate us, but to help educate other physicians. And that's slowly starting to happen. Now, guys, that is going to be today's video, but let us know down in the comment section, who are some other people within the keto space that you would like to see us interview? And then we'll reach out to them and ask them if they would be willing to come onto our program as well. And in the meantime, thank you so much to Dr. Barry for spending time with us this afternoon. We really appreciate you. Yeah. Please do us a favor. Hit that like button down below. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the little bell icon. And that way, every single time we upload a new video, you'll be alerted to it. Until next time. Bye. bye.